Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. There's a movement in places all over the world to get rid of cash and move towards a system where all transactions are processed digitally. Proponents of this concept claim less paper currency means less crime. Everything from bank robberies and terrorism to illegal immigration and tax evasion. On the other hand, detractors worry about hacking, what the hell would happen during a power outage, and the ability of Big Brother to track every cent you spent. Then there's the issue of which system, cash or digital, is more convenient, accessible, and cost efficient. And yes, I'm gonna talk about Bitcoin. Think about a large-scale drug deal, a group of terrorists buying weapons, smugglers conducting human trafficking. You think any of these guys are inclined to write checks to each other? You think arms dealers and narcos generally accept Visa and MasterCard? Yeah, not so much. They deal in cash. It's anonymous, difficult to trace, accepted everywhere. Kenneth Rogoff, a Harvard professor and former chief economist at the IMF, argues that large denominations in particular are the lifeblood of the black market. It's a solid point. The 500 euro note was once nicknamed the Bin Laden. So, the thinking goes, if you were to eliminate cash, you'd deal a death blow to the financial apparatus of the black market. Now, keep in mind, the black market is filled with ordinary people. A lot of small businesses prefer cash so they don't have to pay their legal share of taxes. When someone uses a credit card to buy a meal, for instance, there's a record of it. But when the customers are paying in cash, well, the restaurant can hide the transaction from the tax man. Think about this in terms of illegal immigration. A lot of businesses that attract undocumented workers pay in paper currency, construction, landscaping, food delivery. So if cash goes away, so does one of the main motivations of migration, off the books, economic opportunities. I brought up some of these points to Brett Scott, author of The Heretic's Guide to Global Finance. And he essentially said, um, cash is used for a lot more than committing crimes, and eliminating paper currency in order to screw bad guys and tax dodgers is akin to outlawing cars because they're sometimes used as getaway vehicles. Besides, Scott pointed out, digital currency is used by criminals too, institutional money laundering, for instance. Plus, if all our money was computerized, imagine how vulnerable we'd be to a cyber attack or system malfunction. And what happens if the power grid goes down? Rogoff has also thought of this. In his book, The Curse of Cash, he concedes that, okay, we clearly need some paper bills in certain situations, for the time being, at least. So why don't we just eliminate the big bills, the denominations disproportionately sitting in the black market all over the world? This way, you can still execute petty transactions, you can still pay the babysitter in cash, and there's a backup in case of a digital emergency. Having to use five bills instead of one is a little annoying for your average Joe, but it's a complete logistical nightmare for criminals trying to sneak around with illicit millions. This is why the EU announced it was phasing out the 500 euro note, the Bin Laden, in the aftermath of the November 2015 terrorist attack in France. So now, if you're a criminal and you're trying to exchange or deposit all those big bills, you'll raise some red flags. Something even more widespread happened in India in 2016. Prime Minister Narendra Modi claimed he wanted to curb India's massive black market and its corruption economy. So his government eliminated the rupee's two largest denominations with very little notice. Unfortunately, things did not work out so well. Professor Bhaskar Chakravorty, Dean of Global Business at the Fletcher School, Tufts University, told me the problem began with Moti's true intentions. He knew framing this as an anti-corruption measure would play well to voters, but it had no legitimate hope of cleaning up the black market because, unlike the rest of the world, very little of India's illegitimate assets are held in cash. Instead, real estate, offshore accounts, and even gold are prevalent. So it was people on the bottom of the income ladder who were overwhelmingly paid in paper currency that were the most impacted when the bigger bills went away. Suddenly, there was a problem doling out wages. Stores had to close down. Hospitals turned away patients that couldn't pay. On a national level, income tax compliance went up a bit but the move was attributed to a decline in India's growth rate. So overall, no good. People even died waiting in line to
to exchange or deposit their soon to be outlawed cash. Chuck Avorty, by the way, actually believes that a move away from cash has a lot of potential. It's just that the context has to be right. India didn't have a great digital infrastructure, for instance. Connectivity was an issue. And cash is too embedded in the bloodstream of the country's economy. At the time of the demonetization, cash accounted for about 90% of all transactions in India. And the two eliminated bills were by far the most popular. In places like the US, however, places that are both digitally ready and accustomed to credit cards and apps like Venmo, moving away from paper currency addresses a somewhat counterintuitive problem. Cash is expensive. Chakravorty told me that the expenses associated with credit cards are pretty clear, maybe an annual fee and an interest charge. The cost of cash, on the other hand, is pretty sneaky, especially for low-income people. In fact, the unbanked, who by and large tend to be poor, pay four times more in fees to access their money than those with bank accounts because they rely on things like check cashing services and payday loans. In other words, for the neediest, cash is the most expensive. Cash is also pricey for businesses. It costs money to transport cash in armored vehicles, to secure it on site, to deal with employees dipping into the till. These are time-consuming issues, too. So cashless alternatives like PayPal and Apple Pay are considered more convenient for both customers and businesses. And they seem to align with millennial preferences. One Korean article noted that as younger people move away from cash, physical wallets are literally getting smaller. However, digital wallets aren't accessible for everyone. The elderly often struggle to adopt new technologies. Venmo is a no-go when you can't afford a smartphone. Visa and MasterCard might reject applicants with poor credit. Plus, studies have shown that we spend more freely when we don't have to hand over cash. So, electronic transactions might fuel debt. Digital wallets are also less private. They obviously create a record of what we buy and where we've been. But the Big Brother concerns are much more layered than that. Consider, digital transactions rely on a small number of financial institutions, mostly banks and credit card companies. The majority of payment apps are built to integrate with that structure. These financial institutions, in turn, have to play nice with government regulators. Now, imagine if the government wanted to target a certain activity. Let's say gun ownership. So the government pressures the payment processing and credit card companies to stop working with gun dealers. If cash is gone as an alternative method of payment, all of a sudden it's nearly impossible to operate a gun store. This isn't some dystopian conspiracy theory. In 2015, a sheriff in Illinois wrote a letter and held a press conference encouraging Visa and MasterCard to stop processing payments from Backpage.com, a website that facilitated sex work. In an internal email, a Visa employee referred to this request as blackmail. They felt they had to comply. Corporations don't want to pick a fight with the law, especially when the topic is so icky. But bear in mind, this sheriff was acting on his own, outside of the court system. A judge eventually described his actions as unauthorized, unregulated, foolproof, lawless government coercion. Backpage was eventually shut down, and their lawsuit against that sheriff ultimately failed. But this isn't an isolated incident. Legal marijuana dispensaries, for example, often have a hard time finding a bank because banks are afraid having a grower as a client, even a legal grower, will invite scrutiny from the feds. In addition, a 2013 Department of Justice initiative called Operation Choke Point warned financial institutions they would be investigated if they did business with high-risk industries. Chase complied by shutting down the bank accounts of hundreds of adult entertainers. Some firearm vendors lost the ability to process credit cards. What happens if the DOJ starts to target, I don't know, abortion clinics? Or if the fake news media is truly the enemy of the people, will the government tell MasterCard not to process payments for newspaper subscriptions? Now, many people, especially internet commenters, might claim there's a solution to this problem, namely cryptocurrencies, specifically Bitcoin. However, both Rogoff and Scott point out that the value of Bitcoin is not stable enough to function 
as a usable currency. There's also scale issues. Crypto infrastructure requires a lot of energy for starters. And while Bitcoin is theoretically anonymous, in practice, authorities have been able to trace it and use it as evidence in a whole host of crimes. That regulatory scrutiny will only increase as it goes mainstream. So if crypto has limitations and credit cards and apps have privacy issues, what do people have in mind when they advocate for cashless societies? Professor Thomas Hay, a historian at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, told me that cashless society is an interesting term because it's a negative definition. It describes what isn't instead of what is. And Hay pointed out, the idea that a cashless society is inevitable has persisted since the 1950s. So you have to wonder, when does inevitable become we tried and it didn't work out? Plus, Scott questions if there is popular support for cashless or even less cash societies in the first place. He says, we've been slowly, almost imperceptibly, nudged into thinking it's a good idea by banks with big marketing budgets and a profit motive. Scott also told me that the people who support a move away from cash tend to be the same people who see gentrification as a good thing. Transactions, like neighborhoods, shouldn't be dirty, grimy, or disorganized. You should be able to pay for your matcha latte with the tap of your smartphone. But it's important to remember some people prefer, for a variety of reasons, like culture and cost, the coffee you get at the cramped bodega. So maybe Rogoff's prescription for less cash instead of cash less is a good balance. Take Sweden, for example. The country is sort of the world champion in digital payments. A recent survey found that just 13% of people use cash to make their last purchase there. So banks in Sweden have been cutting back on cash. They're carrying less of it and ATMs are disappearing. Many Swedes, especially young urbanites and a member of the band ABBA, celebrate this trend. But the folks out in the countryside who conduct a greater percentage of their transactions in cash, well, now they have to travel even further to withdraw money. One community missed easy access to paper money so much, they launched a campaign for an ATM. When they finally got one, a party ensued. Okay, I'm gonna go live my life. We are forbidden.